I'm Device from Astralis and welcome to Foreign's YouTube channel. It's a joke free zone. With Astralis winning the E-League Premier for 2018 in dominant fashion without even dropping a map across the entire tournament, a lot of people are looking at this team that's now won their fourth title of the year. They're doing so barely losing maps in the runs where they are, go and end up winning the championship. And so people are already asking themselves, is this going to become the Astralis era? Is this going to be one of the teams that is cemented in history? Like that period, they that belonged to them. They owned that. Obviously, that question has yet to be resolved. There's perhaps more to be done. There's the major coming up. There's more big titles, which they're obviously favorites for. They're certainly in position to do so. But I saw a kind of a corollary topic was one that Device himself mentioned in an interview he did after winning the tournament. I think it was with HLTV.org where he said that this is the best lineup he has ever played in. And so <clears throat> I thought, let's actually contrast the current Astralis with Magisk <clears throat> and the past iterations of the squad with the core of Device, Dupree, and Zipnix. So the current Astralis has won four titles. They've played in five total finals. They've been top four seven times, and they've yet to play in a major because they had Kirby in the lineup when they played in the Boston major at the beginning of the year. Now, that's already pretty crazy stuff. They've won four of those tournaments within a six-tournament span. There hasn't been a major yet, so they can't win a major and cement their legacy that way. But at the tournaments that they've been at, even the ones that they haven't won, they've ten they've made top four at typically. They've been able to get fantastic. I think there was only one they didn't make top four at, which was the first one star series. They've been able to have fantastic performances. And by the way, they lost to Navi there, who almost won the event. They've been able to very rarely lose maps, even in the tournaments they didn't win. And then when they are winning, incredibly dominant form. The majority of series they're playing are two zeros. They're winning at a much higher rate in terms of when they meet, make semifinals and finals than they ever did in the past. But let's go back in the past and let's look at some of these lineups that the core had. So we'll very briefly go back to 2013 when this core did exist and it was called Copenhagen Wolves. And initially they came up in the shadow of a different team called Wolves from Denmark, Western Wolves of Glaive and Pimp and Nico, these players MSL for Lanoff. This lineup didn't play many tournaments that year though because Zipnix only joined the team in 2013. He'd been with Fnatic previously who had a Danish lineup. Device, who was still very young at the time, was in and out of the lineup throughout the year. By the time Zipnix had joined, Device was only there for a few months. He left in the latter part of September. Then he returned right before the major, etc. in November. He himself was only 17 at the time until September of that year. So, you know, this is a very young core. And quite frankly, this wasn't a team that could at all compare to the current Astralis because they were just never placing top four at offline events. They were a team that could maybe make the playoffs and they had different lineups and then they would lose to one of the big tournament favorites there. They weren't really threatening the top of the scene and they obviously didn't win any events. Coming into 2014 though, this year also saw some different lineups. And so again, you can't really contrast it very well against the current Astralis because they started the year with Nico, the opera of Western Wolves in their lineup. Then Cage and B returned. They swapped Cage and out for AZ at some point around the summer. Then Cage and came back towards the end of the year. So if you look at all the lineups that they played with that year, they didn't make any finals. Therefore, they didn't win any titles. They were a very solid team. They managed to place top four six times. To be fair, one of those was a four-team invitational, but they got invited for being a very good team. And, the, and another one was one where it was Fragbite Masters. So the top four teams made the land finals. So a lot of that was online playing. Famously, this squad was fantastic online. So that not really as crazy when you actually put the context in. Still some solid top fours. With that said, though, two of those were with AZ. Four of them were with Cajun B. At the majors that year, they were able to make top four at the first one, Kadavice, where they lost to Nip, 0-2. ESL won Cologne, where they had AZ. They lost to Fnatic, 0-2 in the semis. So two teams that ended up being runners-up. And then DreamHack Winter, famously, they flubbed the veto, really fucked it up. 
and ended up losing 0-2 to to Na'Vi in the round of eight. And at the time, they were favoured to beat Na'Vi. They were supposed to finish top four, probably lose to LDLC in the next round. So actually, they messed up even earlier than expected and didn't even lose to a tournament favourite at that point in time. So this was a squad that was famous for bombing out in semi-finals. This was the team that had the semi-final curse. Didn't matter how good they were, they just weren't making it to these finals. Typically, they lost to NIP and Virtus Pro in very key series, basically all the ones that mattered. This is where the choking curse began because they could beat these guys if it was a group stage game. They could beat these guys online. They looked fantastic against most teams in the world. But you put them against these, notice it's the veteran, the clutch teams, as well as some of the best teams in the world, in the big semi-final, and you just knew they would lose. And in fact, they'd often underperform on one of the maps. They also, and this plays into it, had a much more fragile map pool. This was back when Fetish was their in-game leader, and obviously they didn't have fabulous T-sides at the time, and their map pool was... Yeah, it was a little bit shaky for a team that could co so consistently place top at tournaments. Then we go to 2015, and even though they start the year's Dignitas by about their second event, they've already become TSM, and they've got Carrigan in as their in-game leader now. Now, this is where the team really starts to cook. This is where they start to rack up titles, big finishes, and they already put themselves in a position to be a truly all-time great team. They won five titles this year. They were in 12 finals. To be fair, this was still back when we had some of the smaller events mixed in there. So not every top team was at all these tournaments. Still 12 finals. Very impressive. Only winning five titles out of it. I mean, it shows that you lived in the era of Fnatic, Envious. Top fours, outrageous. 22. Again, some smaller tournaments mixed in there. But even so, 22 top fours. Obviously, teams played a lot more tournaments back then. At the majors... They made it to the round of eight of the first major, ESL 1 Kadavice, where they lost in a close three-game series to Nip, where they actually kind of had the series in terms of side advantage and being poised in position to win on a, a CT side of Nuke. But Heroics by NIP brought it back, get right, and NIP proceeded there, as was always the way when NIP played this team in big series. Then you went to ESL 1 Cologne. They made it to top four there. They lost to Envious, another team who would end up being runners-up. That was a three-game series. It was a pretty good series overall. That was the one where Device had an issue with his mouse, where someone from ESL might have accidentally broken it, putting it in the box, but whatever. Then the last major of the year was the big fuck-up. Again, reminiscent of the year before, where same storyline, make it to two majors, lose to eventual runner-up, and then go to the third major and blow it completely. Because this is the one where Dream Occlusion and Poker, they came in as a team that was expected to go deep. They actually got a bracket that meant they should have been playing in the final against Envious. But instead, they lost in the very first round of the playoffs to NIP in one of the most inexplicable series of all time, where NIP completely dunked all over them, yet NIP themselves weren't very good and got rocked by Na'Vi in the next round. So... This was the first truly great lineup that these players were a part of. I mean, at one point in time, they'd won something like, I think, I think they won seven out of eight best of three series against the Fnatic that, whose era it was. So this is Fnatic's era, and this team's rocking them in the majority of best of three series they play. They won three events in a row at one point in time when they won the PGL CCS kickoff, Interface Stage 1, into Fragbite Masters Season 4. In case you're wondering, Fnatic, the team of the, the, whose area it was, was at all three of these events and in fact lost to TSM at all three of these events. Two of them, they lost uh, at CCS. They lost to them twice, once in a best of five. At Fragbite Masters, they beat them once, but that was upper bracket and then lost in the final. So... As well as winning three events in a row, they won four events out of five overall because they had a, major, a tournament they bombed, which is the first ESL Pro League finals. But then they came back and they won face at stage two. So they had a very nice stretch there already. That's the team that's, that means you're poised to potentially make an error, to do great things. Problem is, as I referenced, they were fragile at the majors. They hadn't broken through at the majors, still hadn't made a major final yet, despite being able to beat all these teams they're playing when they played them in different tournaments. So part of the problem for this team was they actually never took the number one spot throughout the year. They were never able to because of Fnatic's consistency. Even if they beat Fnatic, Fnatic always finished top four or made the finals. And Fnatic obviously was winning other events as well. And so as a result, they could never quite displace Fnatic for number one. They were the second best team consistently 
basically throughout most of the year because they started off being second best to Fnatic overall, even though they could actually beat Fnatic when they played them. Then they came to the point where they were second best to Envious after the French Shuffle. And this is where they actually couldn't beat Envious when they played them. And unfortunately, had to play them in a lot of the finals type scenarios. Hence, stopping them winning more titles. So they kind of didn't get the, the lock on their side in that sense. In terms of the brackets breaking out the way you need them to. Device had really developed this year. In 2013, he'd been just a young up-and-comer with some skills. In 2014, he'd started to emerge as a very good player, but they had a really solid lineup, pretty deep. A lot of good players there. KGB was very good. Dupree was very good. Then, 2015, Device really emerges as a superstar player, becomes potentially the best player in the year by the time you get to the autumn. This was a very well-rounded team, though. A really skilled team from top to bottom. And crucially, unlike past years, they had a fabulous map pool. They could play all six maps in the pool except Cobblestone, which was their perma ban, and they only messed with that towards the end of the year. They could literally play every other map, but to be fair, part of their problem in ages and in some deep scenarios is they just personally didn't like certain maps and so then would go around them. So even though they started out using the map veto and flexing it very heavily, Karen was able to get the wins over Fnatic, etc. By the end of the year, their, map, their veto got a little bit more dodgy, even though their actual strength on the maps, the win rates, tell you they were still fabulous at the majority of them. And this is an era when the only other team with a map pool like that was Fnatic. Then we come to the Astralis team. Obviously, we're going to skip over the one with Kirby and, and, and Carrigan because it didn't really accomplish much. So then we're going to come to the entrance of Glaive to the lineup. Latter part of 2016, Glaive, Kirby, Carrigan, Cajun B out the door already. This is a team where, to contrast this, the TSM lineup played together for about one and a half years, getting their five titles, 12 finals. This lineup played together for about 1.3 years, but actually won less titles. They won three titles and they played in six finals. Top four, they were top four 12 times, 10 of those in a row, which is very impressive. At the majors, they were able to win the first major they played, E-League Atlanta, where they were able to beat Virtus Pro 2-1 in the final, very close final, obviously. They were top four at PGL Krakow, where they lost in narrow fashion to Gambit, eventual champions of the major, in the semi-final. And then at E-League Boston at the beginning of this year, they bombed out in the Swiss system. This is where they had Dupree as their main opera because Device had just come off his illness and they'd had those two events where they'd had stand-ins, obviously at uh, Blast Pro Series and I think it would be ECS Season 4. So this was the year they broke through and took the major. They had a sick streak of top fours. And also, this was the time where, whereas they could have become a, an era-defining team in 2015, they didn't. And when you look at it, it makes a lot of sense. Look at the 2016 to 2017 lineup and the amount of times they were very close to going further or winning an event and therefore, when you look at the sheer number of these I'm about to reference, you can see that they were close to being an era-defined team themselves, but something cost them that. So their first big LAN tournament with this lineup was at IEM Auckland. And at the time, SK Gaming was the number one team in the world. And they had a very close series against SK Gaming in the semifinals, almost stopping SK's legendary streak on train, which at the time I think was at 16 in a row. So... Then they went on to E-League Season 2. At E-League Season 2, they lost in the final to Optic in three maps, despite being actually a heavy favourite at the time. In the semi-finals, they actually had come through and beaten SK and on train and stopped the streak there. In fact, that was the last game FNX ever played for SK. In the finals, they blew it somewhat. The third map famously overpassed and fly went crazy. So Dreamhack Vegas is after they've won the major, they've won ECS. <coughs> They lost three games to Virtus Pro in the semi-finals, who were the eventual winner. Now, for this one, I don't say they would have or should have beaten Virtus Pro. It was very close at the major. Virtus Pro actually massively outplayed them on the two maps. Virtus Pro won here, so fair enough. Virtus Pro was the better team and probably should have won this game. But if you break the brackets any different at all, I think you just see Astralis play Virtus Pro in the final, and that's another second place. And you know what? Second places count more than top fours, and that would be another step towards defining your era. Then you had the Star Ladder Season 3 tournament, which came after they'd bounced back and won Katowice. This was where they were literally at championship point on the deciding third map of Inferno, but back came FaZe, took it to overtime, and FaZe stole it away from them in overtime with the interesting double op set up with Nico and Carrigan. Uh, Alu, rather. So that was a very, very close one. 
If they'd have won that one, it would have been four events in five tournaments. Hmm, that sounds reminiscent of something. Then you had ECS Season 3, where they had the epic semi-final against SK. What an incredibly close series. Really, really impressive stuff. But SK prevailed because SK was one of the most clutch teams of all time. Whereas this team could sometimes break down. Then obviously you have the major PGL Krakow, where they did the hard work. They took out SK, number one favourites, a team that was coming in in dominant fashion, won five out of six tournaments. They beat them 2-0 in the quarterfinals. Then they play Gambit, a team that actually hasn't won any of the big events that year. And they managed to go all the way to a third game, admittedly giving up an overpass game early in the series, but they get to a third map. Third map's train, it was very, very close, but everyone remembers the infamous Gambit, T-Rushes at the end of the game that won them the series. Gambit goes on and wins the major. In this scenario, obviously, Astralis could have won this series. They were favoured to win this series. Then, if they'd have gotten to the final, they would have been playing Immortals, a team that map pool-wise couldn't really match up with them. Wasn't a particularly strong team, and I think the playing style of Immortals would have absolutely collapsed against Astralis. So there was a real chance to win a major, blown by a team that, fair enough, won the other one in close fashion when it got to the final. So you look at it, and those are legitimately... Let's see how many those are. Those are six... Oh, well, let's... Let's take out the the one with um, DreamHack Vegas, because I guess the second place wouldn't really totally change your era. It would just add a little bit extra spice. So five real, legit, potential legacy changes that you add even one or two of these, you're starting to talk about, hey, this could be a leg uh, an era. If you add that major, it's probably discussion over in terms of the, of the entire matter, right? Because people would very easily be able to look past SK's wins because some of them weren't at massive tournaments and some of Faze's finals because they only won one of the finals and if you'd have seen book ending it is two majors and then you have what four or five tournaments in between i think you could make a solid case there so the problem is this team really could have had an era but they didn't manage to and it's partly their own fault they still were a team that despite obviously when you break through you win a major you win a few titles you can't really say that's like a fully weak team but they still sometimes did break down when they were in close series and especially when they're in those close series, in the third map, playing from the T side, their T side often wouldn't come up with enough rounds, despite the fact that is something that they were one of the strongest teams in the world. A fabulous T side, great composition of players, very well run by Glaive, great map pool as a result. But that is one area where that's where the nerves seem to hit them. And obviously, it's a famous area where any team with mental fragility is going to have a harder time getting those rounds out, as opposed to when you're playing on the CT side, you just hold your spots, you try and kill people, and you're just reacting, as opposed to the one having to make the proactive play, make the decision, make the read, and do something that can potentially lose you the game and therefore makes you hesitant. <clears throat> now, if we look at all these different lineups and contrast them, so the Dignitas team, they had some potential, they just didn't deliver upon it. The TSM squad, they showed they were world-class. They showed they were potential winners, but they didn't manage to win those majors. They won titles. Problem is, if you always bomb the majors, you're never going to be the, the number one team. You're never going to be the, the world the era defining team they had rivals their problem was they could beat one of them Fnatic still didn't win the majors though they lost to the other one Envious that cost them a bunch of tournaments and then they had Virtus Pro who used to beat them up in 2014 but now they went back and forth with and it was a fairly even rivalry actually Astralis with Glaive and Kirby could have been an era team lost too many semis and finals blew that second major had rivals but interestingly enough, they came and went while Astralis stayed, actually. Optic rose up, then fell away. Virtus Pro rose up, then fell away. FaZe Clan rose up, was making all those finals, some, uh, in, in, initially outplacing them. Then they fell away. SK came along, won a bunch of tournaments. They fell away afterwards. Obviously, a different FaZe Clan rose up after that. The current Astralis, yes, they are the best of all these lineups. In fact, it's fairly clear, even though they haven't won a major like the last one, even though... They haven't won as many titles or had as many top placings as the TSM lineup from 2015. You just look at what they've done and in such a short span of time. I mean, think about how long they've had this lineup now. It must be something like five months, right? And in five months, they've already won four titles, been in five finals, had a whole bunch of top fours. So the key thing here is they are winning events in not just dominant fashion, but much more dominant fashion. They're winning events at a much higher frequency relative to how many legitimate chances, like how many semi-finals you make it to, how many finals you make it to. They have no true rival. Is Na'Vi their true rival? 
Harvey hasn't won that many big events this year. Is Face Clan their true rival? Face Clan hasn't won that many big events this year and only got them via lineup back together. MIBR's a mess. Team Liquid gets rocked by them every time they play them. Mouse Sports, both lineups haven't managed to find success against them. Fnatic, not even a team that's making it deep anymore. They have no true rival. There's no one really to stop them at the moment except themselves. Yes, sometimes if you can put them in a tough 14-14 game or get them to a decider, you have a chance. But that has happened so few times, it doesn't matter because they're so dominant and they're front running so hard and have such a sick map pool, which they do flex quite heavily against people sometimes, both in the ban and in the pick, that it just makes it too hard. You're always facing an uphill challenge against them. So they are set to become an era winning team. And in terms of how short a time they've been together, unless something drastic happens, they already are the best team that Device has played for, the best iteration of this core. And they look set to win either the major and cement a title, an era, or win the major, or more individual titles regardless, and make an era that way by just overwhelming amount of top placings and big tournament wins. This video was kindly supported by Dean Tanglis, Gardner Wilson, Andreas Snazor Westerland, Alex Adams, Daniel Yordanov, TTMXMP, Vexi, Haupt, Robert Baxter, and Travis Greb, with a special thanks going out to Jerky's Minion. Want teasers for my upcoming content? To ask a question for my monthly AMA? How about taking part in a discussion with me about esports? Or perhaps you want to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Become a part of the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link in the description box below.